Hi there, how are you doing? My name is Matiaba Conrad, a lawyer and a private law tutor. Today basically we are going to, to be looking at the offense of murder and in today's class we are going to define what murder is. We look at the ingredients of the offense, we look at the law that provides for it and then as a bonus just hold on until the end of this video. I'll also take you through the fundamental legal principles governing the offense of murder. So before we start our class, uh, please ensure that you subscribe to my channel. Just below there, there is a red button. Just click on it, turn on the notification, and also ensure that you share and like this video so that your friends can also benefit. So let's start right away with the definition of murder. And uh, basically, you may have known uh, or as you may have read in a number of textbooks or uh, various legal authorities, of course, murder is committed where an accused person uh, ends the life of the party for whom they are accused to have killed. So let's proceed and look at the law that provides for murder. I invite you to look at section 188 of the Penal Code Act of Uganda. It provides for the offense of murder. Let's now proceed to look at the ingredients of the offense. And these ingredients were clearly laid down in the case of Kasim Obura versus Uganda, a case of 1981, High Court Bullet, High Court Bullet page 9. In that case, the following ingredients were laid out. Ingredient number one is the death of a person. Ingredient number two is the death uh, must have been caused unlawfully. Ingredient number three is that there was malice, malice aforethought. Ingredient number four, that the accused directly or indirectly participated in the commission of the offense. This is very, very important. Please also note that when the participants are more than one, you add the ingredient of common intention. So the moment you realize that the participants are three, four, or any number, then you must also add that uh, fifth ingredient. Of course, we are going to be examining these ingredients a little bit more in detail shortly. Just hang on until the end of this video where we're going to make that analysis. So let's proceed very quickly to look at the first ingredient, which is the death of a person. Now, when we talk of the death of a person, here what we mean is that there cannot be murder if uh, the person who uh, on whom the murder is allegedly committed has actually not died. Quite obviously, this is just common sense because if you are accused of murder and then uh, the person is not dead, then definitely there cannot be that offense. So I invite you to look at the case of Uganda versus Anyao Milton and another uh, criminal session number 0005 of 2017. And in this case, uh, Justice Stephen Mubiru, as he then was held that death, can either be proved by a post-mortem report or evidence of a witness who state that they knew the deceased and attended the burial or that they saw the dead body. So it's very important as prosecution that if you're going to prove death, you either adduce a post-mortem report or you bring uh, witnesses in court who may have seen or probably attended the burial ceremony of the deceased person or maybe the people who indeed knew him at the time they were at the burial so they they can also serve as witnesses let's now proceed to look at the second ingredient and the second ingredient is that the death was caused unlawfully uh, authority for this position i encourage you to look at the case of r versus to the son of ochen the case of 1945 uh, volume 12 yaka page 63 and in this case it was held that all homicides in Uganda are presumed by law to be unlawful except where such death are excusable by law e.g. death by lawful sentence. So when we are proving this ingredient of the death that the death was caused unlawfully the moment uh, any death happens the general rule is that the moment a death happens it is of course uh, presumed that such a death is unlawful unless such a death was committed under the law and some of uh, the scenarios where death can be unlawful is uh, maybe after a court uh, order or a sentence of court where someone can be ordered to death so such a type of death is an, uh, is is lawful so save for that all the other other types of death are as a general rule unlawful also of interest under this ingredient you look at section 196 of the penal code act uh, and it is authoritative which defines what amounts to causing death so that section will uh, illustrate 
in detail what causing death actually means. Let's also now proceed to look at the third ingredient, which is there was malice aforethought. Now, the aspect of malice aforethought basically connotes to the mens rea. Okay, it is what connotes to the guilty mind of the accused person. And uh, section 119 of the Penal Code Act is authoritative and it provides for malice aforethought on proof of either knowledge or intention. So how do we prove this malice aforethought? We, the moment we are able to successfully show that the other party had the intention to commit the offense, or maybe they had the knowledge of the same, then we would therefore be trying to prove the malice that such an accused person had in the commission of the offense. Also of interest is the case, is the case of Uganda versus Malaysia and another, it's criminal session number 94 of 2014. And in this case, court held that the kind stroke nature of weapon used um, can also prove the intention. So yes, so court will always look at the nature of the weapon. If, for example, you used a gun, that will also go on to point uh, to the malice aforethought or to the intention. Definitely that is different for someone who maybe used a small stick to hit the deceased and maybe unfortunately the disease passed on. So we'll always look at the nature of the weapon when we are evaluating. Is it a gun? Is it a panga? Is it what, what is the nature of, of, of the weapon? And of course, if the weapon is a dangerous one or capable of causing death, then all that will prove, will prove or rather point to the aspect of malice aforethought. Also of interest is the case of Uganda versus Anyaro Milton and another criminal session number 0005 of 2017. Again, in this case, Justice Stephen Mubiru held that the presence of malice aforethought is established by legitimate inferences from circumstantial evidence. So in some situations, you may not find uh, maybe that there is sufficient evidence on such, uh, let, let's say, murder weapon or anything of the sort, but we can also pick the malice aforethought. We can also pick that mens rea from the inferences or from circumstantial evidence. And this is evidence that is basically pointing uh, that the accused is the one who actually committed the offense. So if there is that circumstantial evidence, that other evidence that points to show that you could be the party who actually involved themselves in the murder, then that would also amount to proof of malice aforethought and it will definitely be a good piece of evidence. Also of interest is section 286, subsection 3 of the Penal Code Act. This section defines a deadly weapon as any weapon used for shooting, cutting, or any other likely to cause death. So any weapon, provided it's likely to cause death, provided it's used for cutting or shooting, then according to the law, that is a deadly weapon and therefore it's likely to cause death. Uh, then also of interest uh, to look at in murder cases is the aspect of the conduct of an accused person. So when we are also evaluating, we'll also look at the conduct of the accused person. How does the accused person behave, okay, before committing the offense and after committing the offense? Do they run away? After killing, do they run to a shrine, for example? After killing, what happens? How did they behave prior to the instance and after the instance? All these elements will be examined and looked at in material detail by court. On the aspect of conduct of an accused person, I encourage you to look at the case of Godfrey Saku versus Uganda, criminal appeal number four of 1998, where court held that malice aforethought can be deduced from, among others, one, previous threats, two, calling the witness to danger, or number three, the conduct of running away. So when we are looking at malice aforethought, when we are looking at the mens rea, the guilty mind of the accused person, we'll also look at other aspects, such as running away after committing the offense, did he run away? But it's also important to note that running away necessarily may not mean that actually the accused has committed the offense. But these are some of the aspects that will holistically evaluate. Of course, coupled together with other aspects and other pieces of evidence. The aspect of calling the deceased to danger, okay? You call a party in, in a forest or in a dark area, and then after calling them, you stab them or you hurt them. 
So we'll look at all these aspects. And then also previous threats. Did the accused person make any previous threats to the deceased? All these will be put into context and they will be considered by court in analyzing and evaluating evidence. Also, the other important aspect apart from conduct of the accused person that we'll always look at in drawing ourselves to the conclusion as to whether indeed the offense of murder is tenable under the law is the nature of the injury inflicted. So this is really very important. We'll always look at the nature of the injury. Okay, The nature of the injury is very, very important. I invite you to look at the case of Kalandio versus Uganda. It's a case uh, reported in Yaka CA number 124 of 1975, where a court held that six big wounds revealed the nature of the attack, showing the intention to cause death. So, of course, if there are six big wounds, surely, that cannot point to the innocence of an accused person. That means that there were a number of attempts to cause injury. There were a number of attempts, six of them, to cause death. And such a type of action can never point to the innocence of an accused person. But for example, if it was maybe one attempt, maybe only one, uh, one strike, that could kind of maybe be put under context by court, although in itself is not conclusive. Let's also proceed to look at another important aspect when we are evaluating the liability as to murder. We'll also look at the part of the body aimed at. Did the accused person aim at the head? Did the accused person aim at an index finger? Or they simply aimed at the ear? These are very important parts. If someone is aiming at the head, if someone is aiming at the, test, at the chest, these are delicate parts that can instantly lead to the death of, um, of, of the victim or of the deceased person. So we'll always look at the part aimed at. If, for example, he aimed at the, at the toes or maybe at the leg, then definitely that points to the aspect or it points to the conclusion that maybe the accused person did not intend to kill this person. Because if they did, then quite obviously they would have aimed at the head or chest or at any other delicate part of the body. And normally the delicate parts of the body are from the waist upwards. Any part from there is extremely delicate and the court may not have leniency um, as to the intention to cause death. Of interest on that aspect of the part of the body aimed at, I invite you to look at the case of Uganda versus Sebuguzi and others. This is a case of 1988 to 1990 reported in high court bullet page 118 and in this case court held that targeting the head quite clearly indicated the desire by the accused to kill and, and this is what i've been laboring to explain and also in the case of peter wetusa and two others versus uganda criminal appeal number 50 of 1998 the supreme court held that malice aforethought can be inferred from one the nature of the weapon and then two the part of the body targeted these are very important aspects that court will always look at uh, when it's drawing itself to the conclusion as to the intention of the accused person and then also lastly on the element of malice is the element that the accused directly or indirectly participated in the commission of the offense. This is really a very vital element because it's what actually puts the accused person on the scene of the crime. Should prosecution or should the state fail to put an accused person on the scene of crime, then they would never have succeeded and they can never succeed to get a conviction uh, of an accused person. So this is very, very important. You either have to show direct involvement of the accused person or even showing indirect involvement in itself is sufficient, provided it attains the standard of beyond reasonable doubt. Of interest on this last element is the case of Shama Koki versus uh, Shama Koki and another versus Uganda. It's a case of 2002 East Africa, volume 2, page 589. And this is a Supreme Court decision. You look at page 589 at 609. And in this case, court held that in a case depending exclusively upon circumstantial evidence, 
the court must find before deciding upon conviction. And please note this, that the exculpatory facts are incompatible with the innocence of the accused and incapable in themselves of explanation upon any other reasonable hypothesis than that of guilt. So if court is really going to depend exclusively on circumstantial evidence, then that piece of circumstantial evidence must point to nothing else but rather to the guilt of the accused person. So ladies and gentlemen, those um, are the ingredients of the offense of murder. And it's also very, very important uh, to note that if a student is always doing their exam, they must proceed to always relate the facts to the law and marry the two. This is always very, very, very important. So thank you very much for listening in into our class today. Once again, do not forget to like and share this video and also subscribe to my channel uh, just below there on the red button. Just click on it and also turn on your notification bar. We we'll look at a group of other offenses in our next uh, in our next class. But today, thank you very much. We meet another day. Bye bye.